so we've been in this, this sermon series in the book of Acts, walking through what, what the early church walked through to try and draw out the principles of what it looks like for us as a young church, as a baby church, a church plant, uh, to, to walk forward together, to grow up as, as individually and together as, as, as disciples of Jesus. And we've called it the beginning of the end uh, because we've been in the end times for 2,000 years. Peter says in Acts chapter 2 that the last days started at Pentecost and they'll end when Jesus comes back. Sometimes we talk about the last days. We're in the end times. Like they've started recently. We've been in them for 2,000 years. We've got nothing to worry about. Jesus is coming back. All the stuff we're scared of is going to happen after he comes back anyway. So we don't need to worry about those things. We're in the last days, the beginning of the end here in the book of Acts. And uh, we've been in the last couple, the last several chapters. Last week we looked at Saul, which is chapter 9. We're going to take a step back and look at Acts chapter 8. Uh, and the reason we're going to look at that, because it's a really key turning point chapter in the book of Acts. You, you see... Pentecost happened, and the church grew to about 10 to 15,000 people in Jerusalem. But they're only, they've only been in Jerusalem. That's where the, the first church was. And if you remember back in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, I'm going to send you out as my witnesses to where? To just Jerusalem, right? No, to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But up until Acts chapter 8, the church has been just in Jerusalem. And there's been some, some hiccups here and there. We had, we had uh, Ananias and Sapphira, and there's been some conflict with Pharisees. But they've been growing. The word has been going forth. That's what Luke tells us. The word continues to go forth, to grow. But there is that undercurrent of conflict, and it comes to a head in chapter 7, in chapter 8, with the death of Stephen, Stephen is the first martyr. He confronts the Jewish authorities and says, you've been unfaithful. And then in chapter 8, that was, his death was the, 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 the trigger event for pers- widespread persecution. The, the headline in mine in chapter 8 says, Saul ravages the church. There's a moment in the, the Lord of the Rings uh, where... where uh, Frodo tells Gandalf that uh, he's known in, in, in a hobbit land, in Hobbiton, in, in, in the, among the hobbit community, as a bit of a troublemaker because of what happened with his uncle Bilbo. And Gandalf resp- responds and says, do you mean that little affair with the dragon? I was barely involved. I just gave him a little nudge out of the door. And in a sense, it's a lot more than this, but chapter 8 is a little bit of a nudge out of the door to get God's people to go go out further than Jerusalem. It's a little bit of a nudge out of the door. I can't do Gandalf's accent. No, I won't embarrass myself and scare all of you. But it's a little bit of a nudge out of the door. Saul Saul brings persecution at the beginning of chapter 8. And the the person we we see throughout the rest of chapter 8 is Philip. You remember Philip from two weeks ago? He was one of those who was called as a deacon because he was full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. And they called him to take care of the widows and those who weren't being fed properly and taken care of. And so, actually, we see Philip change gears here, and he's going to go out as a church planter. And in the beginning of chapter 8, he goes down to Samaria, and there's widespread success. The Samaritans are receiving the gospel. They're hearing about Jesus, and they're turning to Jesus in, in, in great numbers. He has an encounter with Simon. And then, in verse 25, Philip and and the other apostles, because Simon and Peter and John had come down to see what was going on, they go back to Jerusalem. And, And you'll notice that in verse 26, an angel of the Lord says to Philip, they're headed back to Jerusalem, but the angel of the Lord says, hang on, I need you to go, go over here to do this thing for a second. And so, actually, sometimes we think that modern missions and the missions movement of the church is, is a man-made thing. We sort of invented it and went, oh, I guess we should go and do No, no, no. Right from the start, God initiates missions. He did it through the persecution of the church. He does it, he does it here with, with Philip, because Philip is now going to encounter the first, the first record of, of, of a Gentile believer that we have. Up until this point, they've all been either Jews or Hebrew Jews or Hellenistic Jews, or they've been some God-fearers, some proselytes as well. But this is an African. 
He's the first Gentile believer. And so God initiates, and you'll notice that he pushes out, we're going to talk about this in a minute, he pushes Philip out of his comfort zone. Because you see, this persecution was in many ways unexpected for the early church. We live in unexpected times ourselves now. And so this morning I want to talk about three things that Christ witnesses know and do to prepare for the unexpected. How do you prepare for the unexpected? I don't know if you read the, the little blurb that we put on the weekly email, but I Googled, how do you prepare for the unexpected? And the first one that came up on Google was take Saad's law to heart. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but that was the first one that Google said. Assume everything's going to go wrong that can go wrong. We don't believe that as, as, as believers. We actually believe that God's in control. So how do we prepare for the unexpected? The church here is encountering the unexpected, and we have a, a beautiful example here with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch of what that looks like in practices. So three things this morning, this morning about what it looks like to be resilient disciples. The first is this. Christ's witnesses, that's from Acts chapter 1, were his witnesses. Christ's witnesses expect God's direction in fulfilling his mission in, in evangelism. Christ's witnesses expect God's direction in evangelism. The second thing is Christ's witnesses know Jesus intimately through the scriptures. Christ's witnesses know Jesus intimately through the scriptures. We've said this before. We love scripture not for itself, but because it shows us Jesus. And thirdly, Christ's witnesses invite others to respond to Jesus. Three things. Expect God's direction. We know Jesus intimately, and we invite others to respond to him. Let's dive into the first, the first thing here. His witnesses, Christ's witnesses, expect God's direction in evangelism. What do we expect? We see, we see God's fingerprints all over these first verses. The first thing that we ought to expect is we ought to expect divine appointments. That's what happens here in verse 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. The angel of the Lord says to Philip, hey, go over to this, this place. It's a desert place. Go the south road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Go over there. It's, it's not likely to have been a place where there were, were a lot of people. But the Spirit sends Philip over there. It's a divine appointment. Because you see, God is always at work. He's always at work around us. And so we ought to expect those. Those kind of come in a variety of shapes and forms. Sometimes the Spirit directs directly. I don't know if any of us have heard the angel of the Lord saying to you audibly or even perhaps audibly in your mind, go to this place. Maybe you have. If you, haven't, if you have, that's wonderful. Sometimes it's by obedience. One of the ways that we're trying to live that out right now is we do a book table on Mondays. If you'd like to come out and join us in that and see what it's like, just come and serve. You're more than welcome. But we've, we've said... The, the call is go be his witnesses. One of the ways we can do that is we're going to have a book table and try and talk to people. There are lots of other ways, but we're obeying. And sometimes on those Monday mornings, we get the sense that there's a little bit of a divine appointment that happens. Someone comes along who needs to hear, who needs to be prayed for, who needs to be ministered to. We go, oh, because we were obe obeying, God set an appointment. Sometimes it happens through hum human error. Two weeks, last week, two weeks ago, we were out in the street with a bunch of people for three days, and a friend of mine, a new friend of mine called Mike Hack, came down from Manchester, went to the wrong parking lot in Wolverhampton. And it turned out that when he was in the wrong parking lot, he was parked next to this lady who was in her, her car sobbing. And it turned out she was Kurdish, and he he's, he's, was a missionary in the Middle East for a long time, and they spoke about Jesus for 40 minutes. We accidentally told him the wrong parking lot, and it was a divine appointment. Sometimes you turn up somewhere, you're, you're, you, you don't know why, you, you made a mistake, you, something happens and you're in the wrong place at the wrong time according to your timetable, but actually the Lord had you there for a reason. You've ever experienced that? Expect divine appointments. The second thing that we ought to expect here in terms of God's direction is that he's actually at work in us. He's at work in us. 
You see that in verse 26 because the angel speaks to Philip, but he actually continues. He directs him again later on in verse 29 as he gets there and there's a, there's a chariot. Maybe there's a few other travelers on this road and the Spirit says, go up to that, go join that chariot. We see Philip is, is controlled by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit tells him to do something, he rises and he goes. He runs over to the chariot. That's why he was chosen as a deacon, if you remember, because he was full of the Spirit and of wisdom. He was controlled, literally, by the Holy Spirit. And so as we go forth in obedience of Christ's mission, of this commandment that he's given us to make disciples of all nations... We should expect divine appointments, and we should expect him to be at work in us as well. That's the promise that Jesus promised to his disciples in John chapter 14. He said, the Spirit will will bring you into all truth. He'll remind you of what I've said. He says in another place in three different Gospels that when you are brought before authorities, when you're brought before the Romans, when you're brought, to, when they come to take you away to jail, don't worry about what you'll say because the Spirit will tell you. I think there's a principle that we can say when you end up in a tight spot, you could turn to the Lord, turn to Jesus. His Spirit will give you the right things to speak specifically about Him. Because if God's organizing divine appointments, even the bad things that happen to us are opportunities to talk about Him. Expect divine appointments, expect God to be at work in us, and expect God to be at work in others. God is always at work. He's at work in us. He's arranging our circumstances, and He's at work in others as well. Who is the other in this passage? It's this Ethiopian eunuch. He's, he's, he's a Gentile. He's an African. He, he's a eunuch. Now, that might mean he was physically a eunuch, but that term was also used in a general way to, the, to talk about high, people who are, had roles in government as well. So he could have been, he was the minister of finance for Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians as well. So it could have been an extension of his office in that sense. We're not told for sure. But this wasn't, this wasn't a nobody. This wasn't just your average Joe. He was a man of position and of influence. Just as a side note, that term Candace is actually an official term for the queen. The king was considered a son of, a son of the sun. <laughs> and so he was too sacred to actually do any governing. So the queen mother usually ruled in his stead. Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. So he was her minister of finance. And so Philip goes up to him and he sees in verse 28 that he's reading the prophet Isaiah. We're going to talk about in a minute in a second about how, I, how Philip knew that he was reading the prophet Isaiah. But God is at work in him. He's reading the scriptures. He had been in Jerusalem because to worship. So he was some kind of a god fear. Perhaps he was a proselyte, although if he was a true eunuch, that might have been that the Jews didn't had rules against that. The Old Testament does. But he was clearly seeking something and he was reading the the prophet Isaiah. So God is at work in him as well. Friends, as you talk to others who don't know Jesus, whether it's people you know or people you don't know, we ought to expect that God is doing something in their lives. That the Spirit is... That's again the ministry of the Holy Spirit to unbelievers. Jesus promised that he would come to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He's at work in them. He wants to reveal Jesus to them. And so whenever you talk with someone, whether they be a believer or an unbeliever, there's always a third person in that conversation. It's the Holy Spirit. He's in you. He's listening. You're perhaps conversing with him as well. Lord, what do I say in answer to what this person's saying? I'm not quite sure. Expect divine appointments. Expect God to be at work in you and in others. What does this mean for us? Can I suggest that we actually have the ability to provoke gospel conversations with people? What do I mean by that word provoke? It's sort of a, you don't necessarily need to go at it directly directly. 
but you could say things that make people curious about you. How are you doing? What are you, what are you reading today? Sometimes when people come up to the book table, we say, these are books about Jesus. Do you know about Jesus? It, it's the logical, there's the context for it. When you're at work and someone, and, and someone says to you, how was your weekend? Don't skip over church. I was at church. I had a really good time with my church family. Sometimes we get nervous about talking about those things at work in other places, and, and, we, and we need to do so with discernment and wisdom, but you're allowed to, someone asks you, you're allowed to share. I was at church. It was great because I love Jesus. The Spirit's in us. He gives you discernment. It's not just me who, can, who has the Holy Spirit. We each have the Holy Spirit. And so as there is the time and the place and the means and it's appropriate, you're allowed to share, especially when someone asks you. Yeah? And my challenge for me, for, for, for you, and for myself as well, is put yourself into situations where you don't have all the answers. That's what the Spirit did to Philip here. He said, go over there and see what I have for you. I like to be in situations where I have all the answers. Do you? Who here likes being uncomfortable? Uh, Anne, Monday morning, 10 o'clock, Dudley Street. <laughs> yeah? We, we like to have all the answers. But actually, following this calling that he has for us, this purpose, he's calling us out into deeper waters where we don't have our feet on dry land, and he's saying, trust me, trust me, I'll give you the answers. Sometimes we don't have the answers until we start speaking. We're going to see that in a minute. Expect God's direction in evangelism. The second thing that Christ's witnesses need is to know Jesus intimately through the Scriptures. The first thing that I notice here is that Philip knows the scriptures. We're told in verse 30 that he runs up to the chariot and he hears him reading Isaiah. How did he know he was reading Isaiah? Because he knows Isaiah. He's read it before. He knows the scriptures. Yeah? And he's able to ask him, do you understand what you're reading? You see, he's, he's observed that there's an opportunity here as well. We need to know the Scriptures. If we want to know Jesus well through the Scriptures, we have to know the Scriptures. And actually, friends, they are powerful and effective. They are powerful and effective. We can use them. We can use them. When you're talking to someone, when you're talking to a believer or an unbeliever, you could drop, you don't have to say, that's from John chapter 15. You could just drop it in there if it's appropriate. If, you, if someone's telling you about their, their, the difficulty they're having, the, the, and there's a verse that the Spirit brings to mind, you could share that with them. You could tell them where it's from if it's appropriate. But if we believe that these, this is what, this book is what reveals Jesus and we want to reveal Jesus to others, we can know it and use it. We can encourage each other with it as well. We can encourage one another with it as well. Philip knows the scriptures. You notice that he also, he doesn't just know them, he understands them too. He also understands them. Because in verse 35, he's heard that he's reading this, this passage from Isaiah. I've just lost my place. You'll notice that he is reading this passage from Isaiah. It's one of the most, it's the most referenced passage in the New Testament. It's used in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John. It's quoted in Romans. It's quoted in 1 Peter. And here in Acts, seven places. It's also a passage of Scripture that is sometimes called the forbidden chapter. It's no longer read in synagogues as part of, as, as part of the, the reading from the prophets. In the synagogues, they read 
from the law, and then they'll also have readings throughout the year from the prophets. And Isaiah chapter 53 is not read in synagogues. It's called the forbidden chapter. But it's actually the most used passage from the Old Testament by the New Testament. I wonder why. Because it's one of the key Old Testament passages which connects Jesus and the, as the Messiah. That he is the Messiah. You read Isaiah 53 and for us, through the lens of Jesus, we go, check, 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 check. He checks all the boxes. And that's what we see in verse 35, sorry, for verse 34, the eunuch says, about whom, he's asking him an interpretive question, about whom does the prophet say these things? Because it's about the humiliation of Jesus. About whom does he say these things? About himself or about someone else? Those are the two common Jewish interpretations of that passage that Isaiah is talking about himself or that he's talking about someone else, possibly the people of Israel, possibly the enemies of God. And then Philip opens his mouth. It's a phrase to say, it's a way of indicating that he's about to say something really important. But as an aside, I would also note to you that sometimes actions, actually always, actions have to pass to words at some point. I don't know anyone who became a Christian just because of having observed Christians. There was always speaking involved at some point. We have to talk about Jesus. Sometimes we think that if we just live a good life and follow what G- all Jesus' commandments, which involves speaking, ironically, but if we just live a good life and do good things and be like Jesus, that people will sort of get the idea The problem is, is that I, I, know, I, I know lots of Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims who live good moral lives as well. Actually, I know some secular humanists who, know, who live good moral lives as well. And they've got a strong moral code. At some point, we have to open our mouths. And again, we need the Spirit for discernment and wisdom about when to do that and how to do that. And Jesus promised that he would give us the right words. But at some point, we have to open our mouths. And here, it's easy. I I wish it was always this easy. I mean, the eunuch asks a great question. It's like, let me put the ball on the tee for you and just have a good swing at it. It's, He's just, it's all ready to go for Philip. Who is the prophet speaking about? And so Philip opens his mouth. And here we see that he not only knows the scriptures, but he understands them as well. And I love how the King James puts it. He preached Jesus. I've read the ESV and it says he preached the good news about Jesus because the good news is Jesus himself. I kind of like the King James there. He preached Jesus, the person, not a concept, not an idea, not a dead man, Jesus himself, living, risen. He understands the scriptures. Uh, uh, There's a, a an anecdotal story about Spurgeon. He had a group of uh, young men who was training to preach, and he went along to the church where the young man was preaching, preached from the book of Ezekiel. And he got through the sermon, and they had a little sort of uh, time of, of just feedback at the end. And uh, Spurgeon said to him, it was a wonder, very, really well-structured, good message, good application. There's just one problem. I didn't see, hear or see Jesus anywhere in that sermon. And the preacher said, how do you want me to preach Jesus from Ezekiel? This Persian said, friend, until you can do that, you can't preach here again. Because all of Scripture is about Jesus. All of Scripture is about Jesus. That's what we we see here in verse 35. Philip goes back to Isaiah and says, it's about Jesus. And you're saying, Tim, where do you get that from? If you turn with me in Luke chapter 24... Luke chapter 24 and verse 25, and then we'll skip down to verse 44. It's the the two disciples on the road to Emmaus that Jesus meets 
And he says, they tell him what happens, and they're sad that Jesus is dead, and, and they don't understand. And he says to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself from Moses and the prophets. And then he meets with the disciples. If you skip down to verse 44, he says to the disciples, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus himself said to the apostles, it's all about me. All of it. And then verse 45, he says, Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And if I could just point out that that's one of the reasons why we're part of this whole thing of, of telling others about Jesus, is that there needs, there's always that human element. Because actually between the Spirit revealing and us telling and explaining and walking alongside, there always needs to be that help there. Jesus did it for his disciples. Philip did it for the eunuch here. We get to do it for those folks that we know who don't know Jesus. Philip understands the scriptures, and it's really simple. They're all about Jesus. I just want to do a quick side note, briefly, about the law. The Old Testament law. If you turn with me to 1 Timothy, just briefly. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And verse 8 and 9. Paul writes to Timothy and he says this. Now we know that the law is good. The law is contained in the Old Testament. It's the five books of Moses. It's what's called the law. The law is good if... One uses it how? Lawfully, correctly, rightly. And now Paul's going to tell us what the law is intended for. In verse 9, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their mothers and fathers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. In other words, the law is only able to tell us where we went wrong, what we, where we're in error. Yeah, the law can tell us when we fall into sin. That's all it can do. It stops there. I talked to someone the other day, knocked on the door, handing out, doing some surveys. So, what's your? We're talking about moral code and what's? How do you live a good life? And she said, "Well, do no harm. Do no harm. Just don't do anything bad. We're not talking about doing good stuff. Just don't. Just get back to zero. Don't do anything bad." Do no harm. That's all the law can do. That's what Paul says. He says it in Romans as well. He says it in various other places. The law, the moral code of the Old Testament, is only able to tell us where we went wrong. It can't tell us how to go right, how to live a good life, how to please God. And friends, sometimes, as New Testament Christians... We say that, the law can't do this, but then we come back around and Jesus says in John, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And so we go back to the law as a measuring stick for our love for Jesus. And so the law is still the measuring stick. I've got to obey all these things and these laws. We go back to, but the law was only ever intended to tell us where we're, where, where we're wrong, to highlight sin. There's got to be a better measuring stick. Can I suggest to you that the bettering measuring stick is found in Galatians chapter 5? And Paul says this. In verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. The Spirit. And he tells us what those things are in verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Ah, there's the measuring stick. Faithfulness, kindness, joy, peace, patience. Yeah. We walk by the Spirit. We measure our love for Jesus by the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. It's one fruit. You should see all of them developing, not by the precepts of the law. And that therein lies the distinction of Christianity from every other religion. Because every other religion says, here's the precepts of the law. Here's what you have to follow. Here's how you measure how you're doing. The law is never a good measuring stick for how much you love Jesus. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Philip understands the scriptures. And lastly, I just want to point this out, a little detail, kind of funny. Verse 36, some of your Bibles... My brother Best's Bible has verse 37 in there, but some of you might not have verse 37 in there. Some of you, it might be a footnote at the bottom of the page. And some of you, you might not just have it. The reason for that is a thing called textual criticism. What that is, is it's a school of, of, it's science and it's an art as well, where we have thousands and thousands of manuscripts of the scriptures, of the gospels in the New Testament in particular. And they go back and they look for textual variants, places where the, the, the manuscripts are different. It's actually a pretty, it's the science of trying to reconstruct the original text, because we don't have the originals anymore, but we have very early copies. And the reason verse 37 is not in there is actually because we know now in the earliest manuscripts, verse 37 is not there. It's there in later ones, but in the earliest ones, it's not there. Now, the good news is that actually that verse 37 is very biblical. And Philip likely said that. Because he says, if you believe in your heart, he's, the eunuch has said, may I be baptized? And Philip says, if you believe in your heart, with all your heart, you may. And, Je and the eunuch answers, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We would say that. That's scriptural. But that's one of the reasons that that verse 37 is not there in certain translations because the earliest ones don't have it. The reason I'm telling you this is because not only does Philip know the scriptures, does he understand the scriptures, but he trusts them because they are trustworthy and reliable. It's an ongoing science that we have about scriptures. It is the most well-documented, reliable book of antiquity. You read, about, you read Caesar's works, you read Plato and Aristotle, all of those works of antiquity, none of them are as well documented as the scriptures. We can trust this book, that it is 99.99999% close to the original. It's trustworthy. Philip knows, understands, and he trusts the scriptures. What does that mean? What, should, what do you go away and do with that? Let the word of Christ, says Paul in Colossians chapter 3, let the word of Christ, dwell, look, get my R's in there, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Can I encourage you, keep reading, listening to, if you, read, if you listen to audio Bibles, talking about, reflecting on, meditating on, doing it with someone else, keep diving in and engaging with the scriptures. Not just on your own, with others, at Bible study, in church, wherever you're at. Deuteronomy has a wonderful picture of that for parents and their children. It says, whether you're staying in or going out or standing up or sitting down, keep talking about these things. Let it dwell richly within you. And third thing is this. Christ's witnesses invite others to respond to Jesus. This account in verse in chapter 8 is, man, I wish it was always this easy. The, Philip expounds the gospel from the book of Isaiah, which was sort of teed up for him by the eunuch himself. And then the eunuch says, right, here's water. Shall I be baptized? Oh, I wish it was always that easy. The reality is that sometimes we use this passage, sometimes this passage is, we sort of go, hang on, is, is baptism the thing that saves? Because there's sort of a, a skip here and we never see, that's why verse 37 was probably included at some point. There needs to be that decision. And actually, Philip's, we know that Philip's 
presentation of the gospel included that call to repent and believe and be baptized because that was the history from the, from the previous times we've seen the gospel preached in Acts. Peter and John, they always, Jesus himself, repent and believe. That's what's implied here by Luke. And we, it's clear from the eunuch's response that there's been a call to action as well. Repent and believe and be baptized. And so he says, here's water. What's stopping me? Do it right now. Friends, the gospel demands a decision. It demands a decision. If, if, we, if we get the sense that we're preaching Jesus and people feel like they can just be neutral to him, we're probably doing something wrong. Jesus, you can't be neutral about Jesus. He doesn't, he doesn't make that a possibility about himself. And baptism here is the symbol of that decision. It's the outward symbol of an inward change, of new life, of being baptized into the death of Christ and being raised into his life. We sang about it earlier, yet not I, but through Christ in me, his life in me. That's why we practice what's called believer's baptism by immersion in our church. We haven't had one yet. I'm looking forward to the first one. I'm excited about it. Yeah? We practice believer's baptism. We don't do infant baptism. We do baptism where you say, you've chosen for yourself, yes, I believe, I repent and believe the gospel about Jesus. I want to I, I wanna declare it to everybody. I want everyone to know. We practice believer's baptism. And you might be saying to me, Tim, I, uh, invite people to respond to Jesus. That's the pastor's job, right? Maybe, but that happens in a lot of different ways. Sometimes you get people to encounter Jesus by bringing them along to church. Sometimes it's an ongoing relationship that you've been built, you've been, you've known that person for a long time, you've witnessed to them, and one day it finally clicks. Ah, hey, let me introduce you to Jesus. Let me pray with you. Maybe it happens in, this, in the street at a book table, and you're talking to someone. And you say, you know, you can actually talk to Jesus for yourself. Would you like to do that? They say, yeah, I think I would. It hasn't happened to us yet. I'm, that's another one of those that I'm kind of praying that it will happen. We get to invite people to respond to Jesus. But this is hard because the gospel and repentance is antithetical to our culture. If, if you're... We have, our culture has a couple of mantras that we hear a lot. Live your best life now. Be true to yourself. You do you. You have to find yourself and discover yourself and become yourself. And It sounds exhausting. It is exhausting because it's, it's idolatry. It's worshiping self. And idolatry is always exhausting. It saps the life out of you. It saps the life out out of you. And friends, when we're calling people to repentance, when we're calling them to, to, to respond to Jesus, what we're inviting them to is true freedom with the lover of their souls. It's true purpose. It's true peace that's only found in Jesus. It, sometimes we get, we get weird about ah, talking to Jesus. And I suspect talking about Jesus to other people. I suspect that's because sometimes in our minds, we start thinking about Christianity and our faith as another religion, another philosophy, uh, a, 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 an ideology that we're forcing something on people. And if we're involved in the law and doing that kind of stuff we talked about earlier, we're, we're propo proponents of the law, then yeah, we are forcing another philosophy or ideology on people. But if we're talking about Jesus, actually, it's a lot closer to me telling somebody about my wife. You see, when I meet someone for the first time, and they start asking, we start talking, and I, we start exchanging, and hey, where are you from? And what's your, what's your life? My wife comes up very quickly in conversations. Because we're so intertwined, it's hard to tell somebody about my life without telling them about her. And if I'm not telling them about her, you might go, something's wrong there. They're meant to be intertwined and he's not telling, they just left his wife out. 
but we're so intertwined. I can't help. If I want to tell someone about myself, I have to tell them about my wife. And the same is true of Jesus. We want our lives to be so intertwined with his. That's what we sang about. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We want our lives to be so intertwined that when someone asks you how you are, how is your weekend, what's your, what do you do in life, that we can't help but talk about Jesus because it, it does, we, we have no life aside from him. And so my challenge for you this week is who is that person in your life that you love so much that you want them to know about Jesus? Sometimes we, 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 there's this false dichotomy that happens that well, we, if we're, we, we could be friends with people or we can tell them about Jesus. That's That's false. We tell them about Jesus because we love them so very dearly. We care so very dearly for them that we truly believe that he is their eternal hope and their present hope right now. And so my challenge this week is who is that person in your life that you dearly want to invite to respond to Jesus? Would you, would you pray for that person this week? Maybe you already do. Keep praying for them. Because somehow when we start praying those things about someone we love, we start looking for opportunities. We start being willing to step out of our comfort zones a little bit. Who is that person that the Lord has laid on your heart? I want to close with this. You'll notice in verse 40 that as they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip Away. And it says that Philip found himself, in verse 40, at Azotus until he came and he preached the gospel. He continued preaching the gospel until he came to Caesarea. And we lose track of Philip after this, this passage, but we see him later in the book of Acts, and he pops up. He's settled down in Caesarea, and he's got four children, daughters, who are prophetesses. What a wonderful legacy. You see, friends, the mission field is not only out there, but it's also at home. Our children, our families, need to hear and respond to Jesus as well. If you want to experience God's presence, if you want to experience His closeness, His nearness, He's busy calling lost people to Himself. So if you want to be with Him, go to where He's at, and that's where He's at. He's busy calling lost people to Himself. Time is short, friends. Let's not waste our time.